Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We're going to be continuing in on our sermon series on Jesus' I Am statements, where he talks about who he is. Throughout the Gospels, uh, people keep on asking him who he is. They come up to Jesus and ask him, who are you? And he constantly has to tell them, and, and most, more often than not, they just don't get it. And that's what's happening in our reading today. I invite you to open up your Bibles, if you brought them, to John 10. Uh, we're going to be reading from the first 10, cha- uh, 10 verses. Uh, and this, this encounter comes right after Jesus had gone into the temple, and he saw a blind man sitting there. And he, went up to, he goes up to the blind man and he heals his sight. And after he does this, it just throws the Pharisees in a tizzy because they just can't believe what is going on. They, they had already deemed uh, Jesus a sinner and a false prophet, somebody who is blasphemous. And this just took the cake because he did something, he did work on the Sabbath. And so uh, all of chapter 9 is... is, uh, is about this encounter where where the Pharisees are trying to to get to the bottom of what exactly happened here. And it ends with the Pharisees asking who Jesus is. Jesus, who are you? And so Jesus, in all his grace and mercy and his imminent patience, he tells the Pharisees this. He says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of him, and his sheep follow him, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus uses this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters, whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, we often talk about Jesus Christ as the good shepherd. And there's a good reason for that because, well, It's a perfect description of who he is. But we're not going to spend too much time focusing in on that aspect of Jesus Christ because, well, that's a topic for another sermon uh, sermon later on in this series. For a moment, I want to just spend some time looking at the sheep. Now, when we talk about sheep in church, how do we usually describe the sheep? They're kind of stupid, right? We always talk about sheep as being really dumb animals, that they really they just can't live on their own. And that's, I imagine that's true. I've never really done much with sheep, but, but I imagine that's true from what everything I've heard. However, that's not how Jesus describes the sheep in this encounter. No, he says, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. They're, just, they're not just mindless creatures willing to follow anybody. They know who their shepherd is, and they listen to his voice. They recognize the shepherd. And because of that, they recognize who isn't the shepherd. But how'd they get that way? Well, shepherds at the time, they would spend all their time with their sheep. They'd walk alongside of them. They'd often sleep next to them when they were out in the fields, They'd sing to them when the the sheep would get injured. They'd mend their wounds. They spent all their time together, shepherd and sheep. And that's exactly how Jesus Christ is for us. He never leaves us. In fact, he takes it one step further than a shepherd does, and he gives himself to us. Jesus Christ, by sacrificing himself on on the cross, he pours out his spirit onto us. 
That means that each and every one of us will never be apart from our Savior. We have him. He has given himself to us. This is a unique connection, something not found anywhere else but here. That is how much our Savior loves us. He has given himself, he has given everything to us. And we haven't done anything for this. It's not like we chose Jesus Christ to be our shepherd, right? We didn't choose him any more than a sheep chooses their shepherds. No. We have been made his sheep. Just as the sheep of the shepherd's flock are born into his arms, we are born into Christ's arms. That is what makes us his. It's not because we're worth more. It's not because we're, we're smarter or prettier or stronger than the average sheep. No. It's because Christ has made us his. That's what it's all about. What Christ has done for us. This is a truly comforting message. That there's nothing, there's nothing that we that we have done to make Christ his, uh, to make Christ ours. That he has done it all for us. Paul gives us this kind of comfort in Romans 8 when he talks about how nothing can take us from the shave, from God's arms. Nothing can separate us from his love. It's true. There is nothing in this world that is strong enough to rip you from the Father's grip. But at the same time, Paul and many of the other writers in the, in the New Testament warn against wandering off. And as sheep, we like to wander. Luke, in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, we read about that one sheep that, that wanders off from the other 99, and the shepherd has to leave the 99 to go find them. That happens with us, too. And it's dangerous when that happens. See, Jesus is our shepherd. And we know he is our shepherd. We know his voice because we hear it regularly. That is who Jesus is. That's why we gather weekly here to, to hear his voice, to hear his word for us. We spend time with our shepherd. We spend time in his presence. Soon after the sermon, we're going to, uh, we're going to partake in uh, the sacrament of the altar in communion, where we get to be in the presence of the shepherd. That's a blessing. But if we stop doing this, when we start to, to lose the intimate details, we start to lose exactly, uh, we start to, to not recognize exactly who our shepherd is. It's just like any other relationship, really. I mean, if, uh, w- would you ever mistake your, your, your husband for another man? Or, or would you, uh, would you uh, wives, would you uh, mistake another man for your husband, rather? That's, uh, it's a, still a little early. Uh, <laughs> Or, or husbands, would you uh, mistake another woman for your wife? You probably wouldn't. And why is that? It's because you spend time with them. You know them intimately. You know who they are. Same thing with the Savior. Have you ever gone, uh, been away from your hometown for a while and then come back and you see somebody on the street and, and you think you recognize them? In fact, you know you recognize them, you know where they're from. It might have been like a middle school or a grade school classmate, but you can't really put their, their you can't quite uh, say their name. You don't really know what it is. Or have you ever been in like a grocery store or some, somewhere and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I'm so-and-so. Do you remember me? We were classmates. And you're like, uh, I, I don't know who you are. And then, and then it, it comes out that they have mistaken you for somebody else. This happens to me quite frequently. At least when I had, I had longer hair. I had hair down my, down my shoulders for a while. And uh, on uh, at least three occasions, I got mistaken for Weird Al, uh, which I don't know how that happened. But um, uh, yeah, 
Obviously, these people didn't know who Weird Al was because I'm at least 30 years younger than him. And, uh, but this happens, right? We do, don't really know who the person is. If we haven't really spent time in a relationship, we don't really know, we, we, we don't really know that person. We may know the, uh, the, the broad details of their lives. We may, really, we may kind of uh, have clues to their personality, but we don't know them. And even if we had spent a lot of time with them in the past, if we stopped spending time with them, well, we start forgetting those things about them. And so that's exactly how it is in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing can take us from his arms. We should never worry that something will snatch us from his grip. But we shouldn't become complacent thinking that I'm saved. I'm saved and and now there's nothing left. I can just go on my way. I can do whatever I want because, well, Jesus will forgive me. That leads to complacency. And that's what Jesus is talking about. This warning that there are others out there who will lead you astray. There are thieves and there are robbers. They often dress like the shepherd. They often sound like the shepherd too. But if you don't know if, if, if you don't know who the shepherd is, well, it can be easy to mistake them for the shepherd. I was in Pittsburgh last week, and uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I like to do when I'm, uh, when I'm staying in a hotel is turn on the TV. Uh, I'm your stereotypical millennial in, in the respect that uh, I don't watch terrestrial television. I don't get my news from uh, Channel 4 or anything like that. I like to, when I watch TV, I'm going to be watching Netflix, Amazon, or Hulu. And that's it. And so going to a hotel is kind of special because I get to see what, uh, what everybody else is watching in the cable, in cable TV land. So we turned on the TV, uh, and uh, it was a little bit past prime time, and, and this, uh, this TV preacher was on, and she was on fire. She had her microphone way up to her face, and she was just jumping all over the place. She was saying, God loves you. He adores you. He wants the very best for you. And I'm like, all right, I, this, is, this sounds great. Okay. And then she goes on, and he wants you to live the best life now. Tonight. Tonight, if you give $70, just $70, you plant that seed money, he will bless you a hundredfold. You've got car debt. You, you've got car payments. You've got credit card debt. You have a mortgage that you can't pay off. Well, God wants to pay that off for you, just $70, and he will happen. And she quoted all this scripture and everything. And it sounded, it sounded kind of good. But, I mean, we all know that these people are just wolves in the shepherd's clothing, right? Now, she was more... Uh, she was more uh, her prosperity gospel was more overt uh, than, than others, but there's hundreds, if not thousands, of people out there just like her who can quote the scriptures, who have the Bible memorized probably better than most of the pastors here. People who dress like pastors, who, who sound like the shepherd but they're not. They're the thieves and the robbers who jump over the, jump over the, the fence into the pasture. Now we know we can recognize that these people are not, are not the shepherd, and their message is not the gospel. But there's others out there. In fact, we can be, we can, uh, we can start convincing ourselves of uh, of things that makes us those thieves and robbers. We can, start, uh, we can start turning our focus and start putting more priority onto our money, onto success in our jobs. We can make our families, our families our most important priority. 
We can turn them into our main identity. And when we do that, that's when we start wandering off. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and and oftentimes he calls the Pharisees wolves because they're proclaiming the law as the way to as the way to salvation. And so when he's talking to the Pharisees, telling them who he is, they're not quite getting what he's talking about. And so uh, after he tells them that he's the shepherd, they don't really get it. And so he has to continue. And he says this. He says, I am the gate. I'm the door to the pasture. The sheep, the sheep who go through me enter into the pasture. Now we get the good shepherd. We understand that metaphor. But a door, Jesus says the door, that's a little less common in our church talk. But it's nonetheless true. Jesus is the gate. He's the one who leads in to paradise. He is the one who leads to salvation. And there are many other gates that try to mimic him. In fact, all those thieves and robbers, all of them have one thing in common. And that is that they direct you to somewhere other than Christ. They direct you not outward, not seeking outward for your Savior, but inward. These are the gates that seem nice, that seem like they're, they're, they're that seem like they, 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 they would work, but they don't. Jesus is the door. He is the gate that leads to eternity. He loves us. He has died for us. He welcomes us, in, he welcomes us into his family, into his flock, not because we're wealthy, not because we're the best parents or the best children or the best workers, not because we're worthy in any sense, but he does it because we love us. He, he loves us. All these other doors, all these thieves and robbers, they ask more and more from us. They ask us to, be, to improve ourselves to reach salvation. They ask us to be better in some aspect, to improve ourselves. But Christ doesn't. And he doesn't because he knows that it's impossible for us to do that. He doesn't ask anything from us because there is nothing that we can give him that's worth anything. We are sinners. There's not an ounce of worthiness in any one of us. But God does not God doesn't, God didn't throw us away because of that. In fact, he chased us more. He sent us his very son to die for us, to bring us into the flock, and to make us his own. And he doesn't ask anything in return. He pours out his spirit onto us so that we can be pure, so that we can be made righteous. He does everything for us. He goes to the nth degree, to make us his. There is nothing for us to do. Now, that doesn't mean that we can just go off and do anything. No. The difference between uh, the gospel message and the message from the thieves and the robbers is that your salvation, your hope, is found in Jesus Christ and nothing else. He is the one who gives us life. He is the one who gives us hope. And because of Jesus Christ, there is nothing that we should fear. And because Jesus Christ has done everything for us, we are free from having to worry about anything for ourselves and can now go out and love others. We can go out and share that gospel message with others, share that hope of Jesus Christ that life that we have, and to bring others into the flock. Once again, not because it's going to save us, not because our works are going to do anything for our salvation with God, 
but because Jesus Christ has freed us from that obligation, from that, the burden of the law, and allowed us to share that gospel message with the world. That is what Jesus Christ has done. We get to guide others through that gate. We get to lead people to our shepherd, introduce them to our shepherd. Salvation is found in Christ alone. That is where our hope rests. That is where our identity is found. He is the gate, and he is the shepherd. Let us listen to his voice. Let us be in his word regularly. Let us stand in his presence and take part at his table on a regular basis so that we can know his voice. And not only that, but share his word with others. That is the gift that we have. We have been made his sheep because of what he has done, not because of us. And because we are his sheep, we now are able to share that love with others. So let us listen to our Savior. Savior. Let us read his word, be in his presence, because he is our shepherd, he is our gate, he is our loving Lord and creator. So as we go, let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds. In Jesus Christ, until he comes again. Amen. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending us your Son. Without him, we would have no hope. But with him, we have the greatest hope. We have no fear of, of, of death. We do not have to worry if we have done enough because Christ has done it all for us. Lord, help us to, to cling to you. Help us to stay in your word and be in your presence. And help us to be a light to others, sharing that hope, sharing that salvation with those who do not know. All these things we ask and pray in your name. Amen.